The question as to what I did in our experimental animal studies, actually, uh, with regards to casing the main protein of cow's milk and how it related to cancer. I mean, that was some of the early work I got involved in, came out of the Philippines, because there we were pushing protein for feeding malnourished children. What I saw was those families who consumed the most protein, not many, they seemed to have the children who were more likely to get liver cancer. That was a special interest I had. And then there was a report from India uh, also reporting something similar in experimental animals. Higher protein intake basically turns on cancer. Didn't turn it on, but it just supported more cancer growth. So, and it was exactly the opposite of what we were going to the Philippines to do. Not, we wanted to put more protein, but wait a minute, there's, this is kind of odd. So I, I got involved in getting some money to do some research just on the question, you know, uh, how does this cancer work? What, what's the mechanism? I'm in biochemistry. So we're trying to figure out, you know, learning something about the cancer, how it evolves over time. And, and of course, we were using, I was using casein, um, the cow's milk protein. We all did in research. I was using that simply to different levels to change the rate at which these mechanisms occur. So it was experimental. It was only an experimental tool. I wasn't getting that excited about the casein effect, we could just turn on the enzyme and turn it off, we could do this, we could do that. So it was all really narrowly focused. In rats of all things, <laughs> liver cancer specifically, casein, mechanisms, and it turned out to be very exciting because when we started looking at the mechanisms, the rate at which cells grow, the rate at which the carcinogen comes into the cell, the rate at which all kinds of things occur. You know, eventually the rate at which it binds the DNA, the rate at which it causes the mutations, you know, produces growth factor and so forth and so on. We got really caught up in that. And the more I saw, especially the number and the variety of mechanisms that were involved, I said, wait a minute, this, this is pretty overwhelming. And especially when we started comparing the nutrient requirements of the rat with the human in, in part, uh, it, it thought like, you know, this is... And we use experimental animals all the time to do this kind of work. But this looked like this applies to humans. The more we got involved, I said, oh my gosh, you know, casein, if we use the criteria that is used for determining what's a carcinogen, casein is the most relevant chemical carcinogen ever identified. Make no mistake about it. And, uh, and the, the data support it. So all of a sudden, now we're focused on casein. Well, I didn't want to stop just with casein. Now, I wasn't interested in the milk question, really. I was interested in the casein thing. This casein looked really interesting. So then we tried some plant proteins. Didn't do it. We also worked with levels of casein as a source of animal protein, for example. And what came out of all that work over the years uh, was we learned a lot of principles. And we aggregated them all together. It tells us a picture. Here's how cancer works. Here's how nutrition comes into play, in this case, protein. But we did it with dietary fat and pancreatic cancer as well. Not as completely, but we were using, I was just interested in the mechanism of how this darn thing works. But we just happened to be using casein. And finally, you get to a point and say, wait a minute, this, this is too much. I'm coming from a dairy farm. You know, and, and to, to run into that and to tell my colleagues, this is what we're finding, you know, that's, that wasn't the easiest thing to do. And but we kept getting funding from NIH. It uh, kept, kept us going. We got pretty generous funding, and at least somebody was there thinking that we were doing the right thing, and that went on for 27 years. And finally, what came out of it wasn't just to focus on casein and dairy, although that food turned out to be really problematic, obviously. But it was a, a larger question. Where, what about other animal proteins? Do they do something similar to this? What about plant proteins? What about all the other nutrients? What we learned along the way, we could turn on and turn off cancer. Turn it on by increasing casein consumption. Turn it off by decreasing or replacing it with plant protein. That was a really exciting thing, that we could take nutrition and turn cancer on and off. I mean, that, that was pretty startling and really brought into question eventually what role do genes play in cancer formation, what role do 
other environmental chemicals play as carcinogens, you know, all that kind of stuff. How does nutrition compare? And it turns out the cush contrition is, is the heart of the matter. How does this relate to humans, especially people who get cancer or have some signs of getting cancer? Is this, is this something that can be used in that, in that way? Uh, my answer to that, and I've spoken to several sort of oncology groups to try to bring this message to them. They're pretty, they're pretty stiff in their opinion, <laughs> to say the least. They're not trained in nutrition to start with, so they don't tend to want to believe that nutrition has much to do with anything. But then to talk about, you know, this kind of food? Well, so what I see is this. Experimentally, I can defend a proposition. This is the way nutrition works. And it's been ignored. This is another very interesting question. It's been ignored for 200 years. I've just finished writing a big um, history of this field, actually. It's really interesting. So all the while, people in the cancer community have paid almost no attention to nutrition, or if from time to time some information comes up, they discard it. So it's never, never considered. Instead, they want to work with cancer in other ways. They want to see how chemotherapy works. They want to kill cancer cells. They want to do radiation. They want to do surgery when it's appropriate and so forth. But they don't want to give any attention to the role of diet. However, on that question, I have run into a lot of people. I'm not a physician, but obviously, but still, when I give lectures, I have had more people come up to me, oftentimes very emotional, you know, with tears in their eyes, and say they tried this, they had cancer, and it went away. Now, I can't, I know that's anecdotal. You know, you can't publish that stuff. Uh, but there it is. You hear people saying this. They believe it. I believe it because they believe it. Uh, but whether it's for real or not, I, I can't say for sure. On the one hand, on the other hand, there's some evidence in the, in the literature especially with melanoma, you know, that shows that if you take people already diagnosed with a disease, you give them essentially the whole food plant-based diet, in effect, uh, you can really slow down, you know, the emergence of that cancer, maybe, maybe turn it off. It's a limited study, but that's what the evidence tended to suggest. And so knowing that people come and talk, knowing some stuff in the, in the literature like this, and now running into some physicians who are telling me they can't believe what they've seen. I, I, I have a friend in University of Cincinnati right now, medical center, who is a neurosurgeon. And she has a lot, she's treated a lot of cancer patients. She was putting them on the Atkins diet. You know, as soon as the surgery was done and stuff like that, getting a little bit discouraged in her work, but she thought that was it. Then she got on to hearing about this. She tried it and she is She's, her, her interest and enthusiasm has gone through the roof. She has a patient now with glioblastoma, brain cancer, that, you know, is, was it three to six months or something like that they usually give those people? She's now just entered her fourth year and just in really good shape. I know another person also uh, that her son Nelson ran into has glioblastoma, same thing. And she did this and it's going away. I mean, maybe, you know, my colleagues would say, oh, that's spontaneous regression. We don't know what that is and so forth and so on. I said, well, hold it just a second. You know, this is real for these people. And this is a really serious kind of cancer. You know, we, we have a responsibility to go and do some research. And as a matter of fact, right now, John, I'm, I'm involved in um, organizing. I've already written up the proposal. We're getting money now to do exactly this kind of study. You know, in a very professional way. So we have a good, hard look at what's going on. So I, I can't give firm answers to the question, you do this, your cancer is going to go away. But, you know, we, we operate on the basis of odds, don't we, in science? You know, if the odds are suggesting, hey, I should do this, not that, 